Michelle, I think you'll find this informative and educational. It's a little something I like to call, you can't use that. <laughs> In 1654, Otto von Goethe constructed an experiment in which he put two large metal balls together and then pumped the air out. Then he tried to pull them apart. When he couldn't, he called up his buddies. When they couldn't, he called up two teams consisting of 16 horses to pull apart the two balls, at the end of which the sphere was still intact. More on that incident later though, because today we're visiting intensity, pressure and the building blocks of third grade science classes, the three states of matter. So by now I assume that we're all pretty accustomed to the concept behind the three states of matter and how interconversions occur to transfer them from one state to another. Elementary, my dear Watson. But if I were to ask you to tell me the exact energy required to change 300 grams of water temperature by 85 degrees Celsius, would you be able to? I mean, it's not as if there's an exact formula. Oh, okay. Good job, editor. Anyhow, coupled with some extra information such as the specific heat capacity of the substance and its mass, you'd be more than capable of finding out the energy needed to raise its temperature. But you'd be surprised to witness how the temperature of that substance changes as it is cooled or warmed. And by the way, for the preceding example, you'd require 107,000 and 100 joules of energy. The graph on display now depicts the initial rapid rate of change in water's temperature, which slowly plateaus to the 100 degrees mark. Not a straight line to clarify. And instead of boiling, if we were to freeze water to a temperature of minus 20 degrees Celsius, it looks something like this. As you can see, again, water's temperature rapidly drops, however, plateaus at 0 degrees Celsius. Yes, again, it does the same thing and then plateaus at minus 20 degrees Celsius. So why? Well, in the first part of the graph, the temperature difference between the water and its surroundings is vast. However, as it falls, the temperature difference decreases. Then the temperature stops falling as the water starts to freeze, continuing so till the water has frozen. Thus, there's a moment of pause before another change in temperature. And then afterwards, the temperature begins to drop again, only stopping when the ice temperature is that of its surrounding temperature of minus 20 degrees Celsius. It's also important to remember that throughout this entire process, the loss of kinetic energy for the water particles is essentially what helps them tighten and strengthen the intermolecular forces within these substances' simple covalent molecular structure. And um, there is also at a the temperature in which it is impossible to cool a gas further, which is absolute zero. Yeah, the name gives it away. Now this phenomenon was discovered by William Thompson, Baron Kelvin, after which the Kelvin scale is named. Fellow chemist and philosopher Robert Boyle also made significant strides under the connotation of absolute zero by pertaining it to pressure. The researcher's purpose was to find out how the particles of a gas were affected if it kept on being cooled. Thus, with that, he found that as temperature increases, pressure increases whilst directly proportional. However, if the temperature went below the minus 273 degrees Celsius mark, then the particles have no pressure since they are not moving. This is because when we cool gases, the kinetic energy of the particles decrease. The lower the temperature, the less kinetic energy the particles have, hence they move more slowly. At absolute zero, the particles have no thermal or kinetic energy, so they cannot exert pressure. The opposite can be said for heating gases, since its particles then continue to move randomly at a higher speed and thus exert a greater pressure by increasing the number of times they collide with the walls of the container. The exact formula Boyle discovered was initial pressure divided by initial temperature equals end pressure divided by end temperature. Alongside temperature, Boyle also found a relationship between pressure and volume, noticing by doubling pressure the volume of the gas halved. Now considering that the mass of the gas and the temperature stay the same, a particular formula may be applicable, which is initial temperature 
times initial volume equals final pressure times final volume. Now the whole foundation for this discovery resides in terms of the particle theory. If a gas is kept at the same temperature, the average speed of the particles stays the same. However, if the number of particles are compressed into a smaller volume, they will hit the walls of the container more often. Each particle exerts a tiny force on the wall when it collides. As a result, more collisions per second mean a greater force on the wall and therefore a greater pressure. The formula and properties of gases mentioned so far are what make up the gas laws, primarily revolving around the theory that gases are made up of molecules that are continually moving in a random haphazard way, striving to spread out. But that still leaves one question. What about Otto von Gehrig's experiment? That's all, folks. Just kidding, here's what you watched the video so far for. So as the air is pushed out of the sphere, pressure is only acting from the outside. So you'd guess that the sphere itself would crumble into itself, but what actually happens is that the sphere itself becomes unbreakable and unable to be pulled apart. This enactment occurs to the sole fact that Otto von Gehrig chose a sphere for the experiment. Had he chosen any other shape, it would have inevitably crumbled. But what makes a sphere the perfect candidate for this experiment is that it has no weak points by distributing forces evenly across the surface. Therefore, the sphere is kept together by the pressure of the atmosphere around it, pushing the halves together. What some might mistake is that creating the vacuum may only mean that the air pressure inside the sphere would be much less than the pressure outside. It, does, it doesn't imply that the reduced air pressure inside will somehow equal to the outside gas pressure. As we've learned, the halves were pushed together by the surrounding air trying to balance out the pressure exerted by the outside air from another point on the sphere. That's all for today guys. I owe this entire video to my physics teacher. Ms. Carter because she was the one who provided me with the inspiration and the explanation of Von Gehrig's experiment. Thank you all again for watching and stay tuned for my next video on energy resources.